Hi, everybody. Welcome. Today is Wednesday, the 4th of September, 2024. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome our speaker today, Patrick B. Patrick first came into away in 2015. He hails from the beautiful Minnesota in the USA, and that's where he resides now. So I'm going to hand it over to Patrick to share his experience, strength and hope. Take it away, Patrick. Thank you, Rita. My name is Patrick and I'm a compulsive eater. Um, and I'm grateful to be here today and I'm grateful to Rita for the invitation. You know, Rita is the kind of person you can't say no to. Um, I think we talked about me doing this this fall back in, I don't know, it was May or March or April of this year. I put it into my calendar. Um, and I'm always grateful to be able to do service um, like this on an OA meeting. Um, I consider this to be a sacred place for me. Um, it saved my life. I'm I'm not a guy who can um, just grab a food plan and 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 go uh, make an occasional call. Um, I'm a guy that puts on 150 pounds after he had a triple bypass to repair his heart from another addiction. I'm a guy that at 420 pounds, dying of type two diabetes with 11 years in another 12 step fellowship. If you ask me how I'm doing, I'll tell you that I'm fine. You know, on page 62 of the big book, it describes my problem. I'm an extreme example of self-will run riot, though I usually don't think so. I live in an entirely delusional state of mind regarding my addiction. And it's my objection to that that's killing me. What was actually killing me in my life was my desperate attachment to being right about my condition. It wasn't the food. The food was a symptom. Um, and until I got clear and until I came into the rooms of Overeaters Anonymous and was able to identify with other people, was I able to find recovery from this debilitating addiction. I nearly drank myself to death at 44 years old, but food had always been a problem. But at 55 years old, I was 420 pounds having gained, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 pounds in, in um, recover, quote unquote recovery. And I don't claim, I claim sobriety in AA. I didn't drink, but I can't report to you that I was in recovery that whole time. Because recovery, to, to, to my understanding, is, is, is what we read here when it, when it talks about abstinent. And it says spiritual and emotional and physical recovery is the result of working and living the Overeaters Anonymous 12-step program on a daily basis. And if you're new here or you're coming back, I can report to you that for the first time in my life in my 60s, that mind, body, and spirit are all traveling in the same general direction. I'm down well over 200 pounds. I have completely resolved type 2 diabetes with nutrition. I no longer require me diabetic medication. My feet has survived amputations of two toes on both feet. I'm missing the first two toes on both feet, but I have my feet, and they were desperately threatened, as was my right leg at one point. I've resolved sleep apnea. And I just got back from a trip to Phoenix, Arizona, where I was, I was climbing, uh, I was hiking in the foothills of the superstitious, superstition mountains in 90 degree heat for over a couple of hours. Yes, we had plenty of water. I had my camel back on. But if you report to me that that's the possibility when I enter into the rooms of Overeaters Anonymous, I'm probably going to take a swing at you because I'm just angry that I have yet another addiction. I had an interesting experience when I first came into OA. I was sitting with one of the guys I sponsor in AA, and he was fresh off a relapse with whiskey. And, and I, I weighed and measured some food in front of him um, at my house. And he said, what are you doing there? And I said, well, I've joined Overeaters Anonymous. And he said, well, I know that what that's about. And I looked at him as he was shaking from, from, from coming off the alcohol. And I said, well, well what do you got, genius? Right. And he said, well, maybe God just wants you to help more people. 
That had never occurred to me. You see, the gift of my recovery is that I can come here and share with someone on this meeting who may be experiencing despair and hopelessness. And I can tell you unequivocally, without any hesitation, that what we can find here is permanent recovery. My book tells me that. It's in the forward to the second edition, and it's in the, in the run-up to Dr. Bob's story. They use the word permanent. And I'm going to say something here that gets me in a little bit of trouble, but we're on Zoom, so you can't grab me after the meeting and tell me how wrong I am. Relapse is not a part of recovery. It is a part of my story. But recovery, recovered, is a permanent condition if we work these steps and do these things, use these tools. Relapse is a symptom of the illness. That's what the big book tells us. It says that there's something wrong with our spiritual condition. And that's the piece that I, yeah, okay. Because, you know, I'm a guy that can put it down for a minute. But I always come back to it. I picked up food. Uh, the, the, the first memories I have of of compulsively overeating where I'd be found on the kitchen floor of my home um, as a kid, four or five years old after making this, I'd put a chair next to the cupboard and then I'd put a box on top of the chair and then I'd put this soup pot on top of the box and I'd climb up to the very top cupboard where my mother had hid the, the, the chocolate chips for baking. And I'd grab that two pound bag and I'd get probably most of that in me before they'd find me on the floor of the kitchen smeared in chocolate and half passed out from the from the sugar overdose. And then I was the kid that would get remanded all the time for staring, standing in front of the, with the fridge door open, just grabbing what I could to eat. And, you know, they attributed that to me being a mischievous kid. But I'll, I'll report to you now that what was happening was, is that, I was experiencing a need to alter how I was experiencing my day-to-day -day life. Now, I grew up in an alcoholic home. I was witness to and victim of things that no child should be witness to or, or victim of. And I would love to report to you that that's why I'm a compulsive overeater. But it's not. It's in the book. I have a mental obsession and a physical allergy. Once I put sugar or other ingredients into my body, I don't react the same as normal people. My sister can eat a cookie. I've never eaten one cookie in my life. Um, you know, I, I was always overweight as a kid. You know, my, my mother had to buy the husky pants. Um, you know, had to go to the husky section. But um, I, I encountered beverage alcohol. I was fascinated with drinking, obviously, because it was happening a lot in my home, as was overeating. And I discovered beverage alcohol at, at age 13. And I was an off-the-cliff alcoholic. I have the allergy badly. And so what began at age 13 was this, was this dual addiction. I would binge drink and then binge eat to feel better from the binge drinking. Um, and and here's, here, here's what the truth was. What I was experiencing was an internal dialogue that when I didn't have some sort of a buffer was based in deep self-centered fear. The big book on page 62 describes it again that I, I love page 62. I didn't always. The first time I encountered page 62 in the big book, I wanted to set the book on fire and throw it at my sponsor. Let's be clear, okay? Um, but now I love it because it describes my condition. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, there it is again, self-delusion. Is it possible that you're in more trouble than you think you are? And is it possible that your mind cannot assess your current condition accurately. Because if it could, why would you be here today? I had people in my life that were willing to ask me those kinds of questions. 
saved my life. I didn't like the answers and I didn't like the discomfort, but I, if, if you're new here or coming back, I'm here to report to you that if you want peace and serenity, discomfort's a part of the price. But peace and serenity can be long lasting. I have them in my life. At 65 years old, I can report to you that I am at peace with the way I live my life today. And I'm mostly at peace with who I am. There's still work to do. Ask my family. They'll give you a list. But I am at peace with who I am and how I live my life. Mind, body, and spirit all travel in the same general direction. I get to live a life that has... It's on the whole spectrum. I live from despair to joy. I don't live in this little narrow corridor of, of, of oh, I, I, I've got to be okay all the time. I'm willing to do things that are uncomfortable, like hike in the foothills of the superstitious superstition mountains in Phoenix, Arizona, when it's a 95 degrees at nine o'clock in the morning. It was 107 by three. We didn't hike in the afternoon. That much I can report to you. I'm crazy, but I'm not, you know, that crazy. So from 13 to 44, it was full-blown addiction in both both sides. I'd love to tell you all the stories. I, I, I don't think we need to get into the gory details, but I was an overweight alcoholic. Let's just put it that way. Um, I don't know that I was morbidly obese, but I was always at least 60 to 70. I don't know what the qualification for morbidly obese was. I know what it looked like when I was 420 pounds, 11 years into AA. That is morbid obesity. Um, but I was always 60 to 70 pounds overweight. And I identified well with being big because when you grow up in a house like mine, being big's an advantage. You know, um, it was protective for me in many ways. Um, one of the things I experienced when I when I began to lose a large quantity of weight, I think I was down about 125 pounds, and I realized how much smaller I was. And, and some of that fear of, of my not being physically able to keep you away, right? People would hug me, and it was a little too close. You know, body image is a thing in here. Um, so at age 44, um, I had a heart attack during DTs. I'm a guy that'll drink myself into DTs. Um, you know, I'm a chronic alcoholic by the age of 44. I had a heart attack during DTs, uh, left the hospital, drank more, came back, did it again, um, and got into finally, finally, you know, the second... The second near-death experience got my attention. I'm not a guy that 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 pays attention with the first swing of the two by four upside my ear. I I always ask for another. I, I don't know about any of you. Maybe some of you can identify with that here, but but I always need that second crack across the head with the board to get my attention. That hey, you you might want to change something here. So I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, and you know for the first five years I, I did pretty well. I didn't. I think food came in right away, definitely sugar, but I didn't put on a massive amount of weight until at seven years sober, uh, my brother died in my arms of alcoholism. And God and I had a little fight. And I don't know if any of you have had arguments with your higher power, but I'm O for about 100 on that scale. Uh, I haven't won one yet. And I'd be, it, it, you know, self-will run riot stepped in. Well, they're not going to get next to the food. I can eat whatever I want. I'd had a triple bypass at five years sober. And I remember clearly we're waking up in the recovery room thinking, well, I've got a clean bell of health now. I can eat whatever I want. You know, is it possible you're in more trouble than you think? Suddenly the thought crossed his mind in the ICU after a triple bypass that he could eat whatever he wanted. You know, if you read the big book, it says, suddenly the thought crossed my mind that pouring 
whiskey into the milk was a good idea. And everybody giggles at pouring whiskey in the milk because it's stupid. But the most dangerous lines in or, or words in that line are suddenly the thought crossed my mind. And if I go to page 24 in the big book, what do I see? I have no effective mental defense against the first bite. Where do you stand with that today? Do you believe you have the power of choice over food? Because if you do, I don't know if we can help you here. I don't have the power of choice over the first bite. It's not if, it's when. And that's why I need a relationship with a power greater than myself in my life to keep me from it. I can't manage my own food. I call my food into my sponsor every day. I weigh and measure every meal. I use every tool OA has. Why? Because I have to. And now I frame that as why? Because I get to. I get to. I have a structure and a discipline and a commitment in my life that allows me freedom to live the way I see fit. Choice. Discipline. I used to associate the word discipline with punishment. I was wrong. I looked up a definition. Discipline can create freedom in one's life. I'm 185 pounds as I sit here. I'm down well over 220 pounds. I just hiked in the, in the Superstition Mountains. That's the third hiking trip I've taken to the mountain ranges in the United States this year. I have six toes, three on each foot. I have a deformed left foot. I almost lost my legs to, to the chronic neuropathy that I suffer from type 2 diabetes and the infections I got while I was healing and losing weight in alcoholics or in, in Overeaters Anonymous. I'm living, breathing, walking, pretty loud talking evidence of the power of God in the 12 steps and a food plan and quality sponsorship in Overeaters Anonymous. You can recover, but it requires our, our participation. And that's, I think, sometimes, you know, I'm not a guy that's going to run around. If you tell me that you're a compulsive eater, I'm not going to pat you on the back and tell you everything's going to be okay, because it's not. I get worse when I put the food down. That's when the trouble starts. My relapses, I'll give you an example of how that looks. I was in the hospital at about two years. So my 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 uh, my abstinence date is August 26th of 2020. Now, you heard Rita say that I've been in here since 2015. I've had two one-day relapses. One was, was much more about dishonesty than it was overeating. But I was in the hospital at four years into OA in 2020. I had just passed my four-year anniversary. Um, so maybe it was 2019. I'm not sure of the date. But I'd been having trouble with my feet consistently because I'd, I'd gotten a, a condition called Charcot foot. Um, and I had some abscesses on my toes. And your feet are subject to infections badly because, you know, they sweat. They're in shoes. They're even if you bandage them. So I was in, um, I had a bad infection in my right foot. And the numbers wouldn't change. The, the bug numbers, the bacterial numbers wouldn't change. They kept taking samples and, and they're looking at me. And then the infectious disease doctor came in and said, Patrick, you know, and by the way, if the infectious disease doctor shows up in your hospital room and Rita knows this, it ain't good. That ain't the one you want to see. Trust me. Because they'll start talking about taking pieces if things don't change. And that's what she reported to me. She looked me straight in the eye and said, if this infection doesn't improve, we're going to hang one more bag of vancomycin and you can only have two because it'll ruin your kidneys. It's the strongest antibiotic known to man. And she said, if this second bag doesn't affect these numbers, we got to take your leg above the knee tomorrow. Or the infection is going to become, become systemic and kill you. You want to know what my reaction to that 
that consequence of my compulsive overeating is? The kitchen screwed my snack up. I have a metabolic snack and the kitchen at the hospital screwed it up and didn't send it. I had brought food with me. So I thought, well, I'll make my own snack. I made a decision about food and binge date a one pound can of cashew in the hospital with the consequence of losing my leg imminent. I got real clear on step one. I don't have the capacity to make my own decisions regarding food. Um, they came in the next day. I had eaten when I wasn't supposed to. I had obviously overate, so we had to wait. The good news is, is the infections, uh, the numbers on the infections moved enough to allow them to just amputate the first two toes on my right foot and not my leg. I can report to you that my feet have been stable for three years. I haven't had any surgeries in three years. I have a very good orthopedic surgeon. Recovery, and that's when I really committed to this program. I committed to the program by doing a deep dive on why I have to have control of things in my life. And I accepted what, what, what shows up on page 420 of the big book. You know, everybody likes acceptance is the answer on page 14. Well, I can report to you that I accepted a lot of bullshit in my life all the time. What it says on 420 is, is, and acceptance is the answer to my relationship with God today. And I had to get back and get right with God. And for me, what that looks like is, is I need to be committed to recovery. So I attended the, uh, in, in the midst of the, uh, shortly after that episode, I went to the, uh, to the 2015 um international OA, or shortly before that episode, I'd gone to the 2015, uh, how I got into OA, what happened, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now, what happened to me, and I know I'm all over the place here, but you know, that's how I roll. Um, in 2015, I went to the international AA convention at 420 pounds with my legs blown up, I could only walk about 750 feet. I'm in a, in, in the fellowship that I love, with um, with 60,000 of my closest friends because the AA convention is huge. If you ever get an opportunity, we welcome all 12-steppers. You ought to give it a shot. It's in Vancouver, Canada this year. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm there and my I'm sitting on a bench and this couple who I had done, I, I had been moved around in AA because this thing under my nose runs pretty good. And, and I had done a lot of talks and I'd done a lot of cemeteries. You know, I'm a guy that'll memorize the front end of the big book and not do any of it. I sound really good. I can talk it all. I, 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 I maintain, a, I build a really good recovery ego. But I'm at not actually doing what the book asked me to do. It's a theoretical approach. And the book says it. The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. It means that I need to have a regular 10-step practice, a regular 11-step practice. Prayer and meditation have to be a part of my life. It's not negotiable. It's not optional. I have to have a higher power. If you're not currently sponsoring, good luck with staying abstinent. The book's real clear. And it's my objection to that that was killing me. It wasn't anything else. It was, well, God damn it, I don't want to live like this. Petulant anger about having been born with two addictions. I can report to you that the quality of my life today reflects that in recovery from two addictions, I have a life better than anything I could have ever imagined because I have clear and defined purpose. Meaningful purpose in my life. I'm sitting on a bench at the 2015 International AA Convention and this couple approaches me that I had met at a retreat that I led. 
I didn't know she was in OA. I had always assumed she was in AA. She looked at him and said, hey, go get us some coffee. And he said, are you crazy? The lines are an hour long. And she used the wife voice. Guys on, on here, if you're married or anybody with a partner, you know, when your partner looks at you and says, go get me some coffee, he just nodded his head and off he went. And she sat down next to me and grabbed Thank my hand and said, Thank you. She grabbed my hand and said, How you doing? And you know me. I said, I'm fine. Now I'm 420 pounds. I'm dying of type 2 diabetes. I've got chronic neuropathy in both my legs. I've got abscesses on my feet. But I'm fine. She squeezed my hand and she leaned in and she looked me right in the eye and said, Patrick, I mean it. How are you? And in a little lower voice, I said, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And she squeezed. She squeezed my hand one more time and leaned in and looked me square in the eye and said, Patrick, you're full of shit. You're dying. And as a responsible recovered member of Overeaters Anonymous, I can't pass this opportunity to tell you that you don't have to live this way anymore. She had the courage to tell me the truth. She proceeded to 12-step me. It turns out she's just a little bitty thing. She'd always been, uh, wore a prosthetic on her left side. Her, her leg from uh, the knee down was was gone. And I had never, I didn't, you know, that's not a question you ask somebody, hey, how'd you lose that chunk of your leg? I didn't know the story. She'd been well over 270 pounds at about four foot 10 and had lost that leg to type two diabetes. She was a normally weighted member of Overeaters Anonymous at the time she 12 stepped me. She was spiritually fit. She had, she cared much more about my life than she did my feelings. She leaned in. So if you think you're a little whack, I got 12 stepped into another 12 step fellowship at the international convention of my first 12 step fellowship. Right? I mean, come on. So I went home from that convention knowing what the solution was. And I was so pleased with that news that I ate like a madman for another month. It got worse. But one Sunday morning, I woke up with a mustard seed of willingness. And I walked into an Overeaters Anonymous meeting in my in about a mile and a half from my house. So I got to travel like 2,000 miles from my house to Atlanta, Georgia, to go to a convention to be to find out that there's a my what ends up being my home group in OA is is a mile and a half from my house. I go to that meeting and I and I and I I sit there for the meeting and it it appears to be something that <clears throat> I really could use. And I'm getting up and walking out and a man approaches me and, and asks me a rather rude, intrusive question, which was, hey, man, what are you going to have for breakfast tomorrow? Two minutes. Thank you. And I said, you know, I don't know. First time in my life, I sort of asked for help. And he said, hey, why don't you try this? And he gave me what he does. And that's how the journey started for me. Later on, shortly thereafter, I was speaking to a nutritionist because I have medical conditions that require that. I'm not saying anybody else has to. I'd recommend it. They kind of know what we should eat. They did all the numbers on me. I got a food plan from that nutritionist that I use to this day. The result of that has only been that I've lost 220 pounds and put type 2 diabetes in full remission. But, you know, if you don't think you should talk to a nutritionist, God bless. Um, I've had troubles here. Self-will run riots a thing for me. Dishonesty can be a thing. I, I don't make decisions around my food anymore. I work a rigorous, disciplined program of recovery in Overeaters Anonymous that utilizes all the tools and all 12 steps to the best of my ability on a daily basis, which means I screw up regularly, but then I 10-step it, and I make amends where I need to, and I pray and meditate, and I ask for help all the time. And the results speak to them for themselves. I live from the 
free from the bondage of self, willing to be of service to others. I am a sponsor in this fellowship and I am sponsored. I am a sponsor in my other fellowship and I am sponsored there as well. It's made me a better member of my other fellowship. Like I said, I spewed a lot of BS in that fellowship about things you should do, but I wasn't doing. What Overeaters Anonymous has given me the ability to take care of myself. 55 years old, I finally learned how to take care of myself. You've given me the freedom to live a life I never thought I'd get to live. And I can't do it without each and every one of you. So if you're on here and you're struggling, I want you to know there's hope. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how big or small you are. It doesn't matter if you weren't abstinent yesterday. Today can begin a journey to a life that you can't even begin to imagine how good it can get. If you're just willing to set your objections aside and take direction. I'm grateful that... Uh, Rita asked me to, to be here today, and I'll pass. Well, thank you, Patrick. I'm just going to share your photos, actually, just so people can see the before and after from that convention. If you want to unmute and just explain. I forgot to cue. Yeah, I forgot it's okay. to Don't worry. So the one on the left, um, as you face your screen, these are the people. She's the one that 12-stepped me, by the way. Um, and they've given me permission to use their photograph. So you can see the one where I've got the... Uh, the name tag around my neck. That's what I look like at the 2015 International AA Convention. I came back four years later uh, to take a picture in that same restaurant, by the way, that we ate. The, 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 the big picture, the picture where I'm morbidly obese, I had just finished overeating a giant platter of American barbecue, um, which is loaded with, you know, sugary sauces and all kinds of things. And then we came back four years later after I was down. I wasn't down, I wasn't down at maintenance weight yet, but I was down considerably, obviously. And I think you can look at the nature of the smiles that I have on my face and see that one is phony and the other one is genuine and great, grateful. I, uh, I spoke to those two over the weekend on the phone and, and um, I just love them and they love me and um, yeah, I'll be going down to see him in the winter here. The, it gets cold here in Minnesota. So I go see all my Southern friends in the winter. Thank you.